let's solve a problem. So when you're confronted with a large problem like this, I know it's an auto cycle problem, you should have a very firm idea of a PV diagram. You should have a very firm idea of a TS diagram. You should have a very good idea for the first law and the second law written out for the process, processes one to two, two to three, three to four, four to one. Is You probably want to organize your results in a table, two tables, table of properties, just like we did with the vapor power cycle, and a table of energy transfers, or just Q slash Ws, energy transfers during those processes. So the table of properties will be very simple. How many states do you have for this cycle? One, two, three, four. And uh, pressure, maybe in kilopascal, temperature in Kelvin. You're going to populate that table. Some information is given to you in the problem statement. We'll do that. And then the other one, this table of processes, right? Uh, one to two, two to three, three to four, four to one. I'm able to calculate Q and W both in like kilojoules per kilogram, kilojoules per kilogram. Let's go ahead and read this problem and then start computing or filling in this information. So it's an auto cycle. Great. So we're going to go like this, 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 this. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. On the temperature entropy, one to two, two to three, three to four, back to one. Okay. They tell us at uh, 300 Kelvin and 95 kilopascal at the start of the compression stroke. Well, they just gave us T1 and P1. So we'll put that in there. It's 95 kilopascal and 300 Kelvin. R is equal to 9.5, 9.5. Okay, and it's defined as V1 divided by V2, which is the same as V4 divided by V3, because V1 and V4 are the same, and V2 and V3 are the same. That's the compression ratio. All right. And the maximum temperature of the cycle is 1100 Kelvin. You solve a few of these problems, they have to give you some information about the heat input or the maximum temperature. They have to give you something like that. So what did they tell us? Did they tell us temperature at 2, temperature at 3, or temperature at 4? We already know temperature at 1. They told us the temperature at state 3, and that's 1100 Kelvin. Notice that on a TS diagram, that helps us determine, oh yeah, T3 is the highest temperature. It's at the end of the heating. So we continue to read, consider constant specific heats at 300 Kelvin. You can go to the table A20, I believe it is, and you can look up if you need it, C sub V, 0.718 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. C sub P if you need it, we don't for this problem and K of 1.4. All right. What is the temperature at the end of the compression stroke? It should be, you should be able to calculate it to be 738. Let me do this. Let me pause. I'll give just a little hint or two is one is uh, along the process from one to two, S equals C. What does that mean, S equals C? The entropy is constant, as well as from three to four. Notice you can see that here on a TS diagram, S1 and S2 are the same, as well as uh, S3 and S4 are the same. But we have an ideal gas undergoing an isentropic compression from state one to state two, with the assumption we're using constant specific heats. That's a big hint to allow you to calculate T2. <laughs> so I'm going to recycle some space right down in here. And we're going to remember we had a couple of equations out of chapter 6. Something like uh, T2 divided by T1 is equal to some... Uh, 
V1 uh, divided by V2 to the power uh, K minus 1. Was that an equation in the equation sheet? Yeah, it is. It has a number of assumptions. It's restricted for an ideal gas undergoing isentropic process with constant specific heats. And so we can just uh, calculate that the final temperature, T2, at the end is equal to the initial temperature at the beginning of the compression stroke times the compression ratio raised to the K minus 1. Put in our numbers, 300 Kelvin times 9.5 raised to the 0 0.4. 1.4 minus 1 is 0.4. Is that right? Yeah, I gave us K. Up here, K is known. So then that allows us to calculate 738. And there's another digit on there, 738 point something, I forget. But let's now go to what is the peak pressure, P, peak pressure. Where is that at? Is that at state 2, at state 3, at state 4? Which one? Three. So let's calculate P3. How are you going to calculate P3? So what we'll do is we'll do this in two steps. First, we'll get the pressure at state two, and then we'll get the pressure at state three. So don't skip. I think it's better to get the pressure at state two first. So there's another equation. It's like P2 divided by P1 is equal to V1 divided by V2, not to the power K minus 1, but K. Is that right? Sure. And so we're able to calculate the pressure at the end of the compression to be 95 kilopascal times the 9.5 raised to the 1.4. That gives us a pressure to be 2221. Now that you know P2, you think, what's happening between 2 and 3? What's constant? Not S anymore. Between 2 and 3, not T, not P. V is constant. You're right. V is constant. So if uh, V is constant and it always behaves as an ideal gas, can you now calculate P3? Yeah. So, okay, I'm going to pause and make sure a couple of you can calculate it. And we know the answer needs to be 3309. So I need a little bit more room here. But uh, we use the ideal gas equation that V2 is equal to V3 and that V is always RT2 divided by P2 and V3 is always R. T3 divided by P3. Does that make sense? We then cancel the R's. We're asked, asked to calculate P3. P3 is equal to P2 times T3 over T2. How many people got that? Good, good, good. So now we have that part solved. I need to scoop back up. And we'll put in here that it's uh, 3309. Now, Let's go ahead and finish out the table, even though they don't ask for it. And you can calculate the uh, other temperature at state 4 as well as the pressure at state 4. You use the same equations. It's isentropic expansion. This is uh, 447. And I don't know if I really need the pressure, so let's press on. What is the heat addition? There's the answer, it's 259.7, but how do, what are they asking me to solve for? And how do I calculate the heat addition? I'm going to pause and walk around. You can speed me up if you call me over and show me that you know how to calculate it. I'm going to make some room right here. I'm going to erase this, use that as our workspace. And so we know from the first law that Q2 to 3 is equal to U3 minus U2. It's equal to C sub V T3 minus T2. And up here is C sub V. And our T2 and T3 are calculated. And so then we're able to make that calculation and put in there that it's 259.7. That's how many kilojoules of heat transferred per kilogram of mass. All right. Network. How are you going to calculate the network? 
So the net work, when you ask to calc W net, you can think about getting the work one to two, and then work two to three, and then work three to four, and work four to one. Two of them are going to be zero. One's going to be positive. One's going to be negative. But you know what? It's also Q net, isn't it? And you already calculated half of Q net because Q net is Q two to three, that's positive in, plus a Q four to one, which is a negative. That amount is negative. Okay, and then you just sum them. And you already calculated 2 to 3. All I need to do is calculate 4 to 1. All right, so I say that the Q, 4 to 1, is equal to C sub V, U1 minus U4, which is simply C sub V, T1 minus T4. We find out that T1 is lower than T4, hence, yes, it is negative. And then uh, you calculate it now. I calculated that to be a negative... A negative 105.5 kilojoules per kilogram. So what is W net? It's equal to Q net, which is the sum of Q2 to 3, which is 259.7, plus a negative 105.5, and that should come out to be about 154.2. All right, so that's how you get the answer for part D. Now the thermal efficiency of the cycle. The thermal efficiency of the cycle isn't that what I wanted out, a large net work per cycle, divided by what I had to pay for to put in. And I had to pay for the heat two to three. Hey, that's the answer for the previous two parts. I just take the ratio. So if you take the, the ratio of 150, 54 divided by 259.7, you'll get almost 60%. Last part, what about the mean effective pressure? Mean effective pressure is the net work divided by the displacement volume. All right, there's a couple ways to get that displacement volume. All right, so let me scroll down. Is the displacement volume the the distance uh, the distance the difference displacement is that the difference between V1 minus V2 is that true yeah all right uh, you can do this a couple ways is uh, is V2 equal to V1 divided by 9.5 Compression ratio, 9.5. You can do it that way. Now all you need to calculate is V1. It's a little simpler that way. Or you just forget about it and you calculate them both like this. V1 is equal to RT1 divided by P1. Likewise, V2 is RT2 divided by P2. Either one works. You'll, you'll be consistent if you haven't made any errors. And you just calculate um, what is R. Isn't it R bar divided by the molar mass of air? Yeah. 8.314. What are the units on that? Uh, kilojoules. But I know we're working in kilopascal meter cubed, so don't use kilojoule. Use kilopascal meter cubed per kilomole Kelvin. That's R bar. Then we have the molar mass, 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. That's our bar, I mean the molar mass. Then we had our temperature at 1, 300 Kelvin. And then we had our pressure at 1, 95 kilopascal. We chase our units, kilopascals go. Our kilogram, um, I'm sorry, that doesn't go. Kilomoles go, Kelvins go. And we're left with meter cube per kilogram. You calculate that, stick it in and calculate the displacement volume. From the displacement volume, calculate the mean effective pressure. Mean effective pressure comes in around 190. On the next page, I have more numbers. Let me show you the next page. There's more numbers. You want to take a picture of it, study it, fine. I'll put it up on the YouTube video. But here is calculating V displacement. There's the, the numeric value for it. There's the mean effective pressure calculation, et cetera, with the final answer. All right? It's kind of like go here, then there, then there to, to work it all out numerically.
Look good? All right, please be able to do that on an exam. You can also do this in Excel. One of the things that I did in Excel that helps is it really has this organization. It keeps me organized. State one, two, three, four, pressure, temperature. You know what? You can put in a specific volume at each one of those states calculation. It's pretty easy in Excel. Likewise, process, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one, and then the net or the sum of the Q's and the W's. You see that negative values show up. There's the 154.2. Q net is precisely the same as work net. Look for your error, debug. And this is really interesting right here. What did we do in Excel? We plotted a pressure volume diagram, didn't we? Hey, that's what I was sketching. But look at the real data plotted. Does it look like what I sketched? Not really. The state one is right there, and on top of it, state four. They're really close together. But when you compress for this nine and a half to one, you get right there for the, the uh, pressure. And then the pressure at state three brings it up. This is plotted accurately with the right specific volume. And then we know the relationship. This is our isentropic expansion, just like this was our isentropic compression line and out to state four, then back to one, then the two, then the three, etc. So this is what it really looks like. <laughs> All right.